converting the true desires of our heart which God wishes to fulfill. Think back to my seminary days, and like many students for the priesthood, I had one year in the seminary that was particularly difficult, and in which I experienced my human weaknesses to a marked degree. I can still remember getting to the summer holidays after that year and shaking my head in wonder, asking myself, how on earth did I end up doing this or doing that or not doing this which I'd intended to do? It certainly wasn't my desire to do so. Clearly I had been blown off course by some power, a subtle force. Our Catholic spiritual tradition has found it very helpful to discern the signs of the devil's activity in our minds. They include especially agitation, sadness, and discouragement. The devil will try to suggest to us certain traits of thought that will get us worked up with worry, indignation, useless fretting, fear of what we are will happen if we do something with our, in our hearts we know that is right or that we truly desire. We might, for example, desire to share our faith with other people in daily life. And suddenly the devil will put a thought in our minds, what, you do that? Don't be ridiculous, you know what a terrible Catholic you are. If we've decided perhaps to give time to prayer, which the devil particularly hates, the devil present to us all sorts of excuses which sound plausible enough. Leave your sleep, you know, particularly in this hot weather. Do you want people to think you're a fanatic or a hypocrite? There are plenty of good people in the world who don't pray. Isn't it more important to serve others than to pray? Anyway, you can pray on your way to work or on the bus or later in the day. And so on and so on. Of course, our Catholic tradition doesn't just talk about discerning the devil's activity. It also offers us defenses against him. One of the one stories I like the most is the story of a monk called Barsanufius, who led a fairly worldly life in the cities of Egypt, and decided after a conversion experience to join the monks in the desert, and he had a spiritual father, and said to the spiritual father, what do I have to do? Expecting a long list of rules and regulations. And the father said, it's very, very simple. All you have to do is meet with your spiritual father once a day and tell him everything that's been going on in your mind. Pastor Nubius thought that was easy enough. And it turned out to be not quite so easy. But after a couple of years, he met the devil. The devil said to him, Pastor Nubius, you have conquered me. Have I conquered you? Is it through all the fasts, the severe fasts that we engage in, just eating vegetables and bread and water? The devil looked at him and shook his head. No, he said, I don't eat. So is it, is it through all the vigils that we undertake, where we stay up frequently all through the night and pray and just snatch a cup of our sleep the next day? Is that how I've conquered you? Barsanukas gave up and said, well, how have I conquered you? The devil, with a horrible frown on his face, said, through telling your spiritual father everything that goes on in your mind, you have become humble. Ugh! Humble. That, of course, illustrates why one of the most, probably the most powerful way of combating evil in our lives is to turn to our lady. Or perhaps, just to wake you up and shock you, I should say it's the best way to combat not just evil, or obvious evil, but to combat the effects of our goodness, our virtues. They're the most dangerous thing in your life. I shocked you a bit. Of course, what I've got in mind is the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. It was the very virtue of the Pharisee that stood between him and God. Or I think of that wonderful passage at the end of a 
novel by the famous American Catholic novelist Flannery O'Connor. Many people consider this, this novel one of the high points of 20th century Catholic fiction. The Mrs. Turpin, a very respectable character, has done everything right in her life. Then suddenly she's grossly insulted by a young woman who tells us she's a hypocrite. She goes out to the hog pen, I suppose the echo of the prodigal son's pigsty at the back of the house, and she shouts at God and asks him, what are you trying to say to me through this insult? And she has a kind of vision of what Flannery O'Connor calls a vast horde of souls rumbling towards heaven across a bridge. At the front of the crowd are very sort of weird and unsatisfactory people, people who only just escaped from their very obvious sin. But at the back are respectable people like herself. And here I quote from the novel. They were marching behind the others with great dignity, accountable as they always had been for good order and common sense and respectable behavior. They alone were singing on key. Yet she could see by their shocked and altered faces that even their virtues were being burned away. Even their virtues were being burned away as they approached heaven. Let me remind you of the well-known prayer of consecration of our souls to God through the hands of Our Lady, composed by St. Louis Grignan de Montfort. I choose you this day, O Mary, in the presence of the whole heavenly court. For my mother and my queen, I abandon and consecrate to you in total submission and love, my body and soul, my goods both interior and exterior. A very value of my good actions, past, present, and future, leaving to you the entire and full right of disposing of me and all that belongs to me according to your good pleasure for the greater glory of God time and in eternity, the very value of my good actions, even their virtues, were being burned away. Yes, at a certain point in our spiritual life, we need to focus not just on overcoming our obvious sins, but on the struggle that remains even and especially when we are attempting to do good things. How often we experience this. Often we set out to help somebody and we just end up upsetting them. How often we undertake some good work only to spoil it by some human weakness, perhaps by doing things too much in our own way or secretly hoping to be noticed and praised. This is why offering all our works through Mary is of such value, because she is quite free of that hidden taint of selfishness, which so often spoils or weakens what we want to do for God. She's like a water purifier or filter. We can see this, for example, in the story of the Annunciation, the question that Mary asks the angel when she's told what's to happen. She says, how can this be? I'm a virgin. St. Augustine, when he comments on this passage, says we might judge Mary harshly for asking this question. Is it like the questions that Moses asked God when he was told to lead the people out of Egypt when he felt he couldn't do it? Or the Zechariah asked when told that Elizabeth would conceive? Did it signify doubt? Desire for a sign? Did she need time to make up her mind? I always think it's <coughs> amusing in that connection to recall the lovely story of St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. He used to speak so often about the need for detachment. And some clever dick asked him, okay, you're always going on about detachment. Let's imagine that the church was going to suppress your society, the Jesuits. The Pope had decided that he didn't want you anymore. How long would it take you to get detached and to accept this decision in perfect tranquility. And Sir Ignatius is supposed to have taken this question very seriously, and after some thought, to have replied, I think about ten minutes. 
That takes us to the heart of why Mary is so important for us, and why St. Louis de Montfort tells us to keep consecrating our souls to her. When we are faced with the many difficulties of life, and we're trying to see God's will and accept it, there are two different things going on inside our souls. We need to distinguish them. The first difficulty we have is that we are simply creatures. We're limited. Our intelligence is finite. doesn't see everything all at once in the way that a, a pure spirit, an angel, can do. An angel can see everything that God wants it to see immediately. It doesn't have to work things out. And the Annunciation story brings this difference between us and angels out very beautifully by having the message conveyed to Mary by an angel, not directly by God. Adam and Eve, before the fall, were in this state. They were free from sin, but they were subject to all the limitations of creaturely existence. But we have another difficulty. We're also fallen creatures. We have original sin working in our hearts. And the effect of sin is that we have disordered inclinations which remain in us even after baptism, which incline us to make wrong choices. If I've got my plans all laid out for today, for example, and you come along to me and ask me to change my mind and do something different, partly I'm just trying to work out in my mind what's best. But I'm also probably contending possibly with resentment. Who are you to interfere with my life? Or sadness at being asked to give up something I was really looking forward to. And the whole point is that Mary has the first of these difficulties. She's a creature, just like any of us. She needs time to work things out. But she does not have the second. By a wholly unique act of God's grace, which we call her Immaculate Conception, she is free from all those disordered inclinations that continue to work in her heart. Her question to the angel, therefore, says St. Augustine, is not inspired by doubt or resistance. It's simply the childlike question of someone who doesn't yet understand and is inspired by a reverent love to ask what she must do fully to enter into God's plan. And it's clear from that story of St. Ignatius of Loyola that in this she is different from even the greatest of the saints. Even the saints, especially the saints, were aware that this struggle, this resistance continued in them. The great Saint Ignatius was aware that he would have needed time to struggle with his sense of failure and rejection, but he was confident that God's grace was such that it would overcome these feelings quickly. If that was true for him. How much more true for us? The same is true of Mary's suffering. A strong faith in the resurrection of her son did not prevent her from feeling the deepest grief at the unutterably cruel treatment her son experienced, but it was a completely pure grief, free from all trace of self-pity or resentment against God, a grief suffered purely on behalf of another. And again, this is never quite true of us, even in our best moments, which is why Mary teach us to be truly merciful and compassionate to others. In order to experience this, I conclude by recommending to you to take one or two concrete situations in your life as you go away from this church today. Perhaps there's a difficult relationship in your family. Perhaps your finances or some other area of your work or your life are causing you anxiety. Take a day, ten days, a couple of weeks, and every day consciously consecrate, abandon this area of your life to Mary through a few simple acts of trust or prayer, such as the consecration prayer I just recited, or the motto of Pope John Paul II, Totus Tuus, all yours. As St. Louis de Montfort himself says, experience will teach you infinitely more about this than what I can tell you. You will be surprised, and your soul will be full of joy. And joy is the sure sign of Mary's presence. As we know, those very first words of the angel can be quite rightly translated, rejoice, highly favored.
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit.